for the Reserve Bank and the sort of national departments in a, in a seminar at the National Treasury. Um, met with lots of media, as some of you might have seen. A lot of business people, dinners and breakfasts, and a few other events that I've probably forgotten in the world of this week. Um, we do this once or twice a year. We try and bring some of the leading scholars in the world to South Africa, but unusual scholars who think about policy issues and about developing countries. And it's um, a great privilege tonight to have Frank Fukuyama with us. What we're going to do this evening, I'll say a few words of introduction. And Frank is going to talk for about 30, 35 minutes. And then we'll open it for question and answer, which I'll try to control, what might be an unruly mob. And we will go till about 10 to eight, and then Adam Habib, Vice-Chancellor of Wits University, who graciously hosting us tonight, will say a few words of reflection on the evening, and, and then we will conclude. So Francis Fukuyama is a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. He studied at a number of America's leading universities and has taught at some of them. He has written numerous books and is widely read, enormously influential books on a number of different topics, and he has been interested in policy and governance and has founded a powerful policy influencing publication in Washington, D.C. He has also, for a long time, been a very dedicated member of the board of the National Endowment for Democracy in Washington. Frank is not merely an academic high flyer, he is one of the world's most prominent public intellectuals. In an academic community increasingly populated by specialists and people focusing on their silo of interest, he is not afraid of synthesis, crossing disciplines, although firmly based in political science, but he is a man of big ideas and sometimes big answers as well. He is most famous, or his, his fame started initially with a 1989 article on the end of history and a related 1992 book called The End of History and the Last Man that together helped many policymakers and intellectuals start to frame the implications of the end of the Cold War. Professor Fukuyama's analysis was controversial and widely debated. It was also generally misunderstood as an unqualified celebration of the triumph of liberal capitalist democracy. Anyone reading his work, however, rather than just the headlines, will find a very rigorous, serious, academic, in-depth study rather different from what you might have thought and a much more cautionary tone in some respects. So Frank has written a dozen books after that one that started him on his global career and subjects as diverse as neoconservatism, biotechnology, trust, the development gap between Latin America and the United States, and a number of others. And last night, actually, we, we launched in South Africa, or he launched in South Africa, his latest book on identity um, at, at the exclusive books in Santon. Um, in recent years, he has also completed two wide-ranging and ambitious historical studies, looking at the origins of political order and political decay. And those two books, in many respects, are going to be the subject of our lecture tonight, as well as the latest book. And this brings us to the state and development which in many ways is of vital importance to South Africa and has been central to 
Frank's latest works. The state plays a vital role in development, but often the debate about the role of the state assumes the kind of state that exists in rich developed countries. Sorry, when live streaming this debate on TV because so many people couldn't get in, so if I may ask you to please switch off your cell phones completely. Thank you. I'm following instructions. Yeah, me too. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure. Thank you, Anne, for that introduction, and thank you to Hits uh, for hosting me. Uh, I have been following events in South Africa, although I have not been here for about five or six years. Uh, and uh, I really, uh, I've learned a great deal from uh, the week that I've spent here. So uh, I'm gonna get straight into the talk, which is really about the changing role of the state and, and ways that um, people have conceived of the uh, role of the state, both positive and negative. Uh, my title for it is the state and private sector development uh, basically, I don't think you have development and growth without a private sector, and so that actually is the, um, the issue. So, just start out by thinking about what the state is. Uh, we could begin by Max Weber's famous definition, the state is a legitimate monopoly of force over territory. I think that remains a very good working definition that distinguishes the state uh, from other kinds of social institutions, it is really about power. But if you try to disaggregate what a modern state does, it's, it, it's really a very complex uh, institution. This chart comes from the 1997 World Bank World Development Report, which was titled The State in a Changing Society, and it gives you one view of what a state is, going from minimal functions uh, down at the left, to maximal functions uh, on the right. And much of the debate that we've had uh, over the years is where on this axis 
should the state actually come to rest? Should it just perform the minimal functions of basic public goods, or should it engage in things like uh, industrial policy, be a developmental state, uh, intervening uh, to override market, uh, market decisions? Uh, and that is usually, unfortunately, undertaken in ideological terms. I think that you know it's probably good to have a more conceptual uh, framing of where we want to be. In my country, the United States, we love to argue about where on this x-axis uh, we're supposed to be. The Republicans want to move things down to the left, and the Democrats want to move things uh, to the right. Uh, and that argument has gone back and forth over the years. Uh, this is a brief historical overview about a pendulum that's been swinging back and forth uh, over time. I think in the wake of the Great Depression and the post-war period, the pendulum was swinging towards more state activity because capitalism seemed to be in crisis. We just had the biggest uh, economic crisis uh, in uh, recent history. We've had a Soviet Union that was doing better, going faster than most capitalist uh, economies throughout the 1930s and then into the 40s and 50s. Uh, the pendulum swings the other way. I'm going to go over these in greater detail uh, in a period from 81 to 97. Uh, and then it swings in a, in a kind of strange direction uh, in the period after that. So let me just go through uh, each of these very quickly. All right. This is the first period uh, which in, in the emerging developing world you had decolonization, uh, you had institutions like the World Bank that were thinking about how to help uh, countries uh, develop, and there was a lot of emphasis on state intervention, uh, building infrastructure, import substitution, infant industry protection, industrial policy, all of these were ideas that had a great deal of currency at that time. Uh, there were the theoretical basis for this was actually an extremely simple growth model, the Harris Omar growth model that said that basically economic growth is the result of two factors, K and L, capital and labor. Poor countries had a lot of labor and not very much capital. Rich countries were the reverse, and therefore, if you wanted to grow, you had to put capital from rich countries into uh, poor countries. And the model for this was European reconstruction. This is what the United States did in Europe, in post-war Europe, and it led to this uh, miracle uh, of economic growth in Germany and France and Belgium uh, and so forth in the 1950s and 60s. The problem, oops, I'm sorry, there's a missing <laughs> point there. The, the missing point should have said, the problem is that poor countries are missing more than just capital. Uh, they're missing a lot of other things as well uh, that really, I think, lie uh, in the government's area. All right? So, in, oh, again, I apologize. I use these slides this morning, and this one, let me just skip over this one. Uh, this slide would have given you uh, the rationale for infant industry protection because, in fact, there is a logic to it that if you are starting out industrializing, uh, you're not very efficient at first, and you're not going to compete on a global market. And so the idea is that you protect your industries, uh, you protect the domestic, you protect them from international competition until they get uh, sufficiently efficient uh, to be able to compete. And it happened that a number of countries did this quite successfully. They're all in East Asia. This was a strategy that was followed by Japan, uh, and then by South Korea, and then to differing degrees by Taiwan, by uh, China, all right? Uh, and that was a successful form of state intervention following uh, this uh, infant industry model. The problem uh, in this model began to accumulate by the 1970s. You had two big economic shocks in terms of rising, rapidly rising oil prices, stagnation and rates of growth uh, of most industrialized countries, partly triggered by that um, by those oil shocks, uh, rapidly rising inflation uh, throughout the world. Uh, and this really uh, led to a rethinking of the role of the state because in many respects, the state had gotten too large and was actually becoming an impediment uh, to growth. The places where this hit the worst were in Latin America and here in Sub-Saharan Africa. You had debt crises because as a result of the uh, 
oil shocks, you had rapidly accumulating uh, budget deficits, uh, especially in Latin America, in order to deal with this, you basically printed money uh, rather than uh, did any belt tightening. Uh, this then led to sovereign defaults in almost all Latin American countries. You had similar debt problems here in, uh, in Africa. Uh, and a lot of that was actually due to things like industrial policies that had, and state-owned enterprises that had become uh, economically uh, unsustainable. East Asia, as I said, pursued very similar kinds of policies in this early growth period, but they did not suffer a debt crisis. And the reason was that you had governments in places like South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, and so forth, that actually adjusted their fiscal policies, tightened their belts, uh, underwent a period of austerity, and therefore did not uh, uh, accumulate the levels of debt that were experienced in other parts of the developing world. And so in this instance, it was actually governance. There was something that these East Asian governments could do to avoid the kinds of pitfalls uh, that hit other parts of the developing world. Uh, if we just go into this question of rents, I think this li lies at the, uh, at the base of what some of the problems were. So this is the technical definition of a rent uh, in uh, economics. There's lots of different kinds of rents. Some of them are actually good, like patents and, and trademarks. Others uh, are simply ways for the government to generate revenues by creating artificial scarcities. Uh, and that was the fate of a lot of the industrial policies pursued by developing countries in the 1950s and 60s. They created loss-making institutions that then developed political constituencies that turned out to be impossible to actually turn them into profit-making enterprises. Uh, and as a result, governments had to subsidize them. So this is the problem, you know, this is the essential problem. And you hear, you know, talk about a return of a developmental state, but it's important to remember you know, the conditions for success of a developmental state. Uh, they happened primarily in the part of the world that was able to discipline them and put them under fiscal constraints, under hard budget constraints. In other parts of the world, the politics did not permit that. The politics created vested interests in the continuation uh, of public enterprises that were no longer viable. And this is really what led to uh, the crisis uh, of the 1970s. Well, this is rent seeking. <laughs> uh, you know, this is the problem when governments get involved uh, too heavily in picking winners and in uh, subsidizing particular sectors of the economy. This first cartoon is about the American attempt to move to alternative uh, energy sources where solar panels were, were subsidized. Uh, this fellow down here is a taxi driver. This is another type of rent. Uh, who's very mad about Uber moving into his city because uh, the taxi industry actually uh, uh, builds off of rents because it artificially constricts the supply of uh, cabs, and therefore, if you expand the supply, people's incomes are going to fall. Are going to fall, and that was a rent that had been collected by the taxi industry and is now being uh, eliminated by greater competition from uh, uh, from firms like Uber. All right, so this then leads to the Washington Consensus, this period in the late 19, well, it begins really with the election of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan in Britain and the United States. Ronald Reagan comes into office saying, government, government is not the solution, government is the problem. And the entire thrust of policy making coming out of places like London and Washington was to move in exactly the opposite direction, to get the state out of the way of the private sector through this list of policy uh, uh, recommendations known as the Washington Consensus. Uh, they were formulated by an economist, uh, John Williamson. Uh, a lot of them were not all that incorrect. Uh, governments should not run persistent budget deficits. Taxation ought to be designed for efficiency. Uh, and sometimes they were too, ta uh, too tall or too high. Uh, in other cases, you had artificial uh, impediments to trade uh, that were restricting the scope of markets uh, and the like. And so there was, again, a good uh, economic rationale behind 
uh, this list. It didn't work out uh, entirely as planned. It worked out in certain countries. So there were some countries that actually did workouts under the guidance of this set of neoliberal principles. Uh, Argentina was one in the early 1990s. Uganda, in the first few years when Museveni was president, went through uh, that kind of checklist and they actually stabilized their uh, money supplies and then got economic growth going. But there are a lot of problems because I think that the people backing the Washington consensus had forgotten about the importance of a state. Uh, in a way, they were dizzy with success, as Stalin used to say uh, of certain of his adherents, that they, you know, they, they had a reasonable argument in terms of artificial government barriers to, uh, you know, to the private market that were creating inefficiencies, but they took it the next stage to say that private markets could become uh, self-regulating and basically where governments were everywhere an enemy of economic growth, uh, and it resulted in a lot of bad things happening. So the first warning sign, I think, were the failed privatizations that took place in places like Russia and Ukraine. Uh, American economists and, and the international financial institutions were urging rapid privatization in countries that did not have the state capacity to do an auction of public assets fairly. So what happens in these two countries, they're bought, those assets are bought by insiders that have uh, special knowledge. It's a case of asymmetric information. Uh, they take advantage of that special knowledge. They end up with the public assets, the former public assets. And that's why, to this day, you have a class of oligarchs uh, in those countries. Right? In order to privatize, you have to have a capable state that can hold a, f a fair uh, auction uh, of, public, uh, of public assets, and that uh, did not exist. Uh, trade pacts, you know, you were expanding the World Trade Organization, you were negotiating the North American Free Trade Agreement, the European Union was taking down uh, trade barriers within Europe. That had positive effects in terms of aggregate growth, but there were a lot of distributional problems with that. If you took your trade theory course and absorbed what your professor was saying, uh, that professor should have told you that a system of free trade, reduced tariff barriers will make everybody better off in the aggregate. But not everybody in every country is better off as a result of this system, and in particular, uh, low-skilled workers in rich countries are likely to lose employment to similarly skilled workers in poor countries. And in fact, that's what began happening. Uh, you had a process of deindustrialization. Uh, you had rising middle classes in China, Vietnam, India, other places. But then you had uh, the stagnation and in many cases the decline of real incomes for working class people throughout uh, the industrialized world, and so there was both the fear and the reality of growing inequality, and that, in fact, happened. And then finally, liberalization of the financial sector, which took place progressively in the 1980s and 90s, uh, turned into a disaster. You know, there really were no financial crises uh, rocking the world economy in the entire period from the end of the Great Depression really through the early 1990s. And then all of a sudden you have a whole series beginning with the Sterling crisis in 1991, the East Asian financial crisis in 97, Russia, and then the big one, the United States subprime crisis in 2008. Uh, and it was a direct result of the fact that the financial sector is different. Uh, there was a efficient market hypothesis that said that actually prices were the most accurate indicators of relative scarcities. And I think by now we see that that simply, it, 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 it probably doesn't apply in most markets uh, in, in many cases, but it certainly does not apply in financial markets that are subject to uh, booms, to speculative uh, bubbles, uh, and then to uh, panics. Uh, and so when finance was liberalized, you basically introduced a tremendous amount of instability into the global financial uh, system. Large financial institutions can impose costs on the rest of the uh, economy that a manufacturing industry simply cannot. 
because finance is so interconnected. So when Lehman Brothers collapsed in September of 2008, basically the entire short-term payment system uh, throughout the developed world stopped functioning. Companies could not get overnight lending because they were too worried about the solvency of their counterparties. And so it turned out that governments had to bail out these big banks. And believe me, that was politically not popular. <laughs> uh, you know, the banks in many respects have been responsible for creating the crisis in the first place by over leveraging themselves. And then they get into trouble and then the taxpayer uh, is expected to come along and bail them out. Now, I think in, you know, thinking as an economist, you can see why this is necessary because central banks have to play this role of lender of last resort uh, to inject liquidity in a system that's basically solvent but illiquid. Uh, that's the justification for it. But you try to tell that to an average taxpayer or voter uh, in a developed country that you're bailing out Goldman Sachs uh, uh, for your benefit, uh, it's not going to play very well. And to this day, uh, there's a lot of resentment, uh, I think, left against the banks, who, by the way, have very good lobbyists uh, and are able to put their case to bureaucracies and legislators very well in a way that ordinary people are not. And so I think this contributed you know, very greatly to a sense of injustice uh, that you had a global financial capitalism that created this instability and crisis. They got bailed out, they survived the system, and ordinary people uh, were hurt. Growing inequality, I think, was a reality. Uh, this is the Gini coefficient of the United States from the period from 1967 uh, up until a few years after the financial crisis, where basically the top 1% uh, of income earners in the United States uh, were taking home something you know, north of um, you know, maybe about 15% of GDP. Uh, and a lot of ordinary uh, workers were seeing actual cuts to their income. Between 2000 and uh, 2015, uh, basically half of all American workers saw no increase in their real incomes. Uh, and in the meantime, you got a whole class of very rich people emerging uh, as a result of this globalized financial system. Uh, and again, this leads to a accurate perception that things are really not fair and things are not working out uh, for ordinary people. So there's another shift, I think, in thinking about economic growth that occurs as a result of some of these failures. So as I said, a lot of the problems in the earlier models, either when you were injecting the state into the economy or taking the state out, had to do with the fact that the states themselves didn't have the capacity to actually execute either the entry or the exit. Uh, and in any event, many of the states, particularly in the developing world, were plagued by low capacity uh, and high levels of corruption. Uh, there was a speech that was given by James Wolfenson in 1996, where he spoke for the first time about the cancer of corruption. And a lot of the attention of the international donor community began to shift to the question of good, uh, good governance and anti-corruption. And by the way, the end of the Cold War meant that politically, uh, the United States could start criticizing you know, Mobutu Zaire, one of the most corrupt countries uh, in Africa, where previously it had been a client and therefore immune from that kind of pressure. So there is a good reason for thinking that this agenda is an appropriate one. So uh, you have a X and a Y axis. So this is the old X axis of the scope of state functions that can be minimal or they can be uh, extensive. But there's also a Y axis. Uh, which has to do, you know, you can call it the strength of the state, you can call it state capacity, you can call it quality of government. Every one of the functions that the state does along this axis, whoops, sorry, uh, does along this, oh, all right, uh, does along this axis can be done either poorly or it can be done well. Uh, and there is an increasing um, emphasis on the quality of government as opposed to simply how much government do you have, all right? And that leads to this third period in which the 
major impetus is not necessarily to make things smaller or larger, but to make them better, to improve, to move countries up, uh, up that y-axis through anti-corruption measures, increasing state capacity, measures to promote transparency and accountability in the interests of better quality uh, government. Now, how do you measure that y-axis? Uh, this chart comes from the World Bank's World Development Indicators. There are actually six of them all together. Uh, these are just two. Uh, one of them is control of corruption, and the other one is effectiveness, government effectiveness. Uh, as you can see, they are largely correlated in most countries. Uh, and so we're going from you know, Denmark and Singapore and the Netherlands that have high quality government to Somalia, North Korea, Afghanistan, uh, down at that end of the spectrum. It's probably not surprising where these different countries end up uh, on, this, uh, uh, on this chart. If you plot, if you actually try to put some real numbers into that matrix that I just gave you, so in this chart, the x-axis is revenue as a percent of GDP, which is one measure of how extensive the state is, right? So uh, the welfare states in Europe, you know, a country like Denmark, has a lot of uh, and very high tax rate because it's got a very extensive state. Uh, others have lower ones. And then the y-axis is that World Bank government effectiveness um, indicator. And I think the takeaway from this, I mean, this is only a, a very selected group of countries, but I think this would apply even if you did it to all you know, 180 countries that the World Bank follows. There are basically no developed countries below you know, the midpoint of that, uh, that y-axis. Uh, there are rich countries that have relatively smaller states, like Japan, Singapore, and the United States, and then there are rich countries that have much more extensive states, like Netherlands, Denmark, France, uh, and so forth. They're all rich, but what they have in common is that they've got reasonably high capacity, relatively un, uh, uncorrupt governments, whereas poor countries, almost by definition, are in the bottom two quadrants of that, uh, of that chart. And so the question then is, maybe we shouldn't be worried about you know, moving them this way or that way. We should be trying to move them uh, upwards in that, uh, in that matrix. So that was the emphasis for you know, a good period of time from the late 1990s, I think. And, and in, a, in a way, that still is the agenda for many development institutions. Uh, the problem, I think, is not that in theory this is a good agenda, because I think that, and if you think about South Africa, if you think what's holding South Africa back, I would say maybe massive corruption is one of those issues that, you know, is, is, a, uh, is a factor uh, explaining poor performance in uh, many different areas. The problem is that it's very hard to do. Why is it hard to do? Uh, the problem, I think, basically is political, right? That if you have something like systemic corruption, and there are many countries, in fact, there are plenty of countries that are much worse than South Africa in this regard. I mean, you know, Brazil, Mexico, India, Indonesia, uh, they all probably actually rank uh, lower in you know the anti-corruption index than South Africa does. You've got an entire political class, an entire business class that is involved in systematic rent collection, stealing, you know, bribery. Uh, so this is a condition of quite a few uh, quite a few countries. The problem with trying to deal with this is that it's not a conceptual issue, and it's not one that's going to be solved by. Uh, World Bank people going to that country and lecturing them about the importance of good governance. You know, telling them, well, in Denmark, they don't do things like you do it. You know, you, you have, you've got clean institutions, officials don't take bribes, you know, your prime minister isn't a big crook, uh, and so forth. It doesn't do any good because the reason that this kind of bad governance exists is not that people are ignorant of the way things are done in Denmark, it is that they've got a personal interest in collecting those rents. Uh, and unless you find a way to get them out of power, they're not going to stop doing what they're doing. Uh, and therefore, if you're an external donor, uh, an international financial institution, and you're trying to persuade uh, 
these very same officials to behave better, you don't have very many sources of leverage against them. Right? If you're the World Bank, you say, well, you're not going to get any more loans. We'll give you this tranche, but you're certainly not going to get the second tranche unless you shape up. And then they don't shape up, and they say, well, you're not going to get the third tranche if you don't shape up. Right? So this, I think, was the essential problem. And uh, this is, you know, I think, where that governance agenda sits right now, that you know, we understand that it's important, but ultimately it is a political uh, question, uh, and it's not going to be solved unless within those countries um, there, is a, there is a movement to you know, really uh, fix things by replacing corrupt leaders, prosecuting them, and then putting in place institutions that reduce the in institutional incentives. Uh, to do this kind of rent-seeking uh, and corrupt behavior. So the question is, what's the next big idea if governance is not going to be the uh, path? By the way, I, I shouldn't say that. Governance, you know, good governance should be the proper path, but it's going to have to await the right political conditions, right? So there's been a lot of, you know, other approaches to development. The donors have spent a lot of money on public health, uh, it's actually because I think you can show that you invest a lot of money and you get real results. So there are a number of diseases like river blindness that have been completely eliminated. HIV AIDS has been brought under control. Malaria, there have been a lot of uh, improvements. Uh, the problem is that no country ever got rich uh, just by investing in public health. You've had the return of industrial policy because uh, again, a lot of people have said, well, look, you know, South Korea, Japan, Singapore, all these countries uh, used industrial policy uh, to good effect, so why don't we consider, you know, uh, pushing our economy a little bit through subsidies and state intervention? Uh, as I said, I don't think the conditions are any different now than they were in the 1950s. You have to have a certain kind of government if you're going to do this effectively. If your government is corrupt, ineffective, low capacity, I would stay a million miles away from, um, uh, from industrial policy and from trying to be a developmental state because it isn't going to work. It's simply going to feed uh, a lot of corruption. Danny Roderick talks about this globalization trilemma where you can't actually have all good things at the same time. You can't have globalization, high interaction, sovereignty and uh, democracy uh, together. Now, I just want to say something about the China model because that is the major competing model that's out there that combines authoritarian government with um, a partially privatized uh, market. But I want to talk about, in particular, their activities overseas because they have a different model for helping poor countries become rich. Uh, it's not by investing in public health, it's by investing in public infrastructure. They do that because that was the model that they themselves uh, followed in China. You know, they spent almost a trillion dollars on their high-speed rail system. And so they now have a high-speed rail system that has an order of magnitude more uh, miles of, of, of track than the next largest uh, system in the world. Uh, so the Chinese have a lot of advantages when they come and offer uh, an investment package to a poor country, let's say somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa, Ghana, or Ethiopia, uh, or Mozambique. Uh, they've got very centralized uh, decision-making. They can do things quickly. They've obviously got a lot of capital to uh, invest. Uh, they've got lower costs in most cases. And if you are a politician that wants to show that you've done something within your electoral cycle, uh, you'd much better go to a Chinese uh, source of funding uh, than to a Western one. That's going to be much slower uh, and, uh, uh, and much more costly. There are a lot of disadvantages, however, to taking up that bargain. Uh, the first thing, so this is a business school, right? So in, the ERR is an external rate of return, right? So if you're investing in infrastructure, you first calculate the internal rate of return, like how much is this dam going to generate in revenues? But then if you're a government, you say, well, what's the external rate of return, meaning what are the spillover benefits to the rest of the economy, you know, to the society, uh, and so forth. And I would say that from the study that we recently at Stanford concluded, the Chinese are not very good at estimating this. They tend to overestimate 
the positive externalities and vastly underestimate the negative ones, meaning things like environmental damage, you know, the social damage when you move people out of a floodplain for a big dam project. Uh, corruption, you know, is another big cost of doing business with uh, China. Uh, they seem to be unaware of uh, political risk in many cases, uh, and it means that the speed and the cost, the initial cost of their projects oftentimes doesn't pay uh, in the long run because they haven't correctly estimated the long-term uh, cost of their um, uh, investment. So this is a caution because this really is the major route uh, to growth and investment uh, in this part of the world at the present moment. Now, I'm sorry, I'm running a little bit longer than I anticipated, but I need to talk about this issue because I do think that this is one of the big political results of the, you know, the, the kind of period of neoliberalism that uh, uh, we've gone through of globalization where trade barriers came down and trade and investment across borders uh, expanded. Now, as I said, it had these negative distributional impacts, it was actually very important in terms of aggregate go growth. So the global economy quadrupled uh, in size between 1970 and the crisis in 2008. So the economists were not wrong when they said this is the way that you get rich. And in fact, millions, hundreds of millions of people uh, came out of poverty in this period in places like China, India, Vietnam, Bangladesh, uh, and so forth, all right? But there were large increases in inequality in many countries, and especially in uh, rich countries. Uh, and this has led to the emergence of uh, a populist backlash against globalization, beginning in my country, beginning in the United States of America, where Donald Trump was elected in uh, 2016. Uh, the problem with populism is not that it's popular. <laughs> you know, democracy, you're supposed to follow what the people want. The problem with populism is that many of the new populist leaders uh, feel that they've got a direct mandate from the people to execute their agenda, uh, and they don't like the liberal parts of liberal democracy, meaning constitutional checks and balances, courts and independent media, all of the things that limit the power of, uh, of an executive in a modern uh, state, and so therefore they have attacked those institutions and tried to, uh, tried to undermine them. Uh, immigration has become a big uh, issue for them. Uh, this is really related to the theme of the book that Anne uh, referred to, uh, Identity, because I think that the groups that have been the most um, able to take advantage of resentment at the kind of inequality that has appeared are not on the left, they, they are on the right. And it's a curious thing because with this growth of global equality, you think that left-wing parties would be doing well everywhere. And in fact, uh, throughout Europe and, uh, and in the United States, uh, they have actually been declining, right? The French Socialist Party disappeared a couple of years ago. The German Social Democrats have gone from about 45% of the popular vote to about 25% in that same period. Uh, and in the meantime, you're getting the growth of all of these new right-wing populist parties. And why is that the case? I think it is because of this identity issue that populist parties have been able to use immigration uh, as an explanation to people who have lost their jobs as to why they're doing badly. You can blame it on foreigners. You can blame it on immigrants that are coming into the country. Or you can blame it on elites that are uh, supposedly helping those immigrants steal jobs from uh, their, fellow, uh, their fellow countrymen. Uh, and that is exactly the narrative that uh, my president, Donald Trump, has been articulating. Uh, and that's what got him elected, or at least in the Electoral College in the United States. Uh, so these are the older populists. These are the newer ones, right? Marine Le Pen and Geert Wilders in the Netherlands. Kaczynski in Poland, Alice Fidel, who's one of the members of the AFD in Germany. Um, I think that there are a number of reasons why we're seeing this upsurge right now. So we've been over the economic ones. There are political ones because democracies oftentimes don't make decisions decisively. Uh, and 
people have a kind of longing for a strong man. They say we need somebody to get past all these chattering people in parliament and actually get things done. Uh, and then finally, this cultural issue having to do with uh, identity that uh, people feel that the globalized world uh, is making some people rich, not them, but it's also stealing from them their national identity. So a lot of the Brexit voters, for example, their single most important issue was the fact that Britain was filling up with foreigners. Uh, and they didn't like it because they thought that they constituted you know, the media in Britain, and all of a sudden it was uh, somebody from uh, outside. Uh, and all of these cultural and economic motives, uh, I think, are very uh, hard to disentangle. So this is the end. Right now, I don't think that there is an overarching uh, development model that people are being urged to follow. Uh, that's in a certain way a good thing because I think that in a way a single development model is never actually going to be good for every country because every country's conditions are, uh, are you know, influenced by history, by where they are in the development pro process, by their institutions and culture. Uh, and you can be trapped by ideology. I think that was the problem in the 1980s and 90s. American free market economists you know, thought they really understood the way the world works. And it turns out they, they uh, didn't really. Uh, but there's also a lot of dangers because a lot of bad ideas that had been in circulation and at one point had been discredited are now coming back. Uh, and one of those ideas, I think, is industrial policy, which, as I said, will only work under certain special conditions of you know, high quality uh, governance. And then the final point uh, is simply this about the primacy of politics. Uh, because I think good quality government is ultimately uh, the most important factor determining the overall ability of a country to develop, you need to improve the quality of government. You need to deal with corruption. You need to create capacity uh, in the state to deliver the kinds of services, uh, the security, and the other things that citizens demand. But you're only going to do that as a result of a political, largely internal political uh, process. So if you want economic growth, you actually do have to pay uh, attention to politics. So thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Wh what we're going to do, because I know there are lots of people who want to get a chance to ask a question or comment, is if you can be as brief as possible, please. And I'm going to group, I'm going to take three people and then ask Frank to respond. So if I can get hands, gentlemen at the back. Good evening, or Sakile Jameni from the Embassy of Switzerland. Thank you for the presentation, Frank. A question that I have is with regards to the fourth industrial revolution and technology. How does the advent of uh, blockchain, AI, and all the cloud computing technologies impact uh -huh. a nation state rising on the Y axis of better governance and rather on the X axis? Thank you. Okay. Great. That's one. Um, there was somebody down here. Yes. Professor. Uh, I want to refer to your slide about inequality, and you said that inequality rose from um, point 0.3 to point 0.8 over the states over the time. Um, what is a healthy level of inequality? Obviously, we can't have zero and we can't have one. Uh, can you please just discuss? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yes. I saw somebody. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mark Oppenheimer from Johannesburg Bar. So the South African government um, is contemplating changing our Bill of Rights to allow for expropriation of land without compensation. What is the likely effect of that on South Africa's economy uh, and its status in the global community? Okay. Uh, so on the question of technology, <laughs> so first of all, I basically think blockchain is a big fraud. Uh, and I really don't think, I mean, I can explain my reasons for saying that. Uh, I can see certain applications for distributed ledger technology, but you know the, the, the cryptocurrencies I really do think are just 
big scams that uh, over time will uh, hopefully go away or get regulated out of existence. On the other hand, artificial intelligence is not a scam. I mean, that is perhaps one of the biggest social challenges because uh, it means that you know a lot of our jobs are going to disappear. I mean, in my neighborhood in Palo Alto, California, outside of Stanford University, we see driverless cars all the time uh, that are being tested. And you just think about the three million taxi drivers and three million truck drivers in the United States alone that will lose their jobs you know, once this technology hits. Uh, and what are you going to do uh, to replace them? So I don't have an answer uh, to that specifically. The generic one that economists give, I think, is, is correct as far as it goes, which is Essentially, you have to retrain people and give them the kinds of skills that, and because technological change doesn't just destroy jobs, it creates, uh, it creates new ones. And so there are going to be new skills that people have to learn. The problem is it's not that easy to do. Uh, it's not that easy for governments to take a 50-year-old truck driver and give him or her the skills that will allow them to you know, survive in a digital world. So uh, that is definitely... Um, and in general, I think that we've always been playing a, a, a game of catch-up. You know, certainly since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this is a discussion I've had with Anne over the past couple of days. I actually think that this is not, we're not in a uniquely accelerating period of technological change, although it seems like that. I think actually the period in the late 19th century was much more dramatic in terms of the basic technologies that were introduced and the changes that made as people went from agrarian societies to urban industrial ones. And I think actually what we're experiencing now is, is slower than that. Nonetheless, you know, we thought that the internet was a friend of ours uh, up until, you know, the Russians started um, interfering in the American election and you know, this sort of thing. Um, and, you know, we have to come up with solutions to that. But I do think that historically every disruptive technology eventually is brought under control, under social regulation. Then the technology advances, and then you got another challenge that you've got to solve. And so we're on this kind of treadmill. Uh, we're never going to get off it, but I don't think that the problems that we see right now are necessarily the ones that we're going to face you know, another 30, 40 years down the road. Uh, on the question of equality, is there an optimal level of equality? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. There used to be uh, this Kuznets curve, uh, named after the economist Simon Kuznets, that argued that uh, as you develop, you actually increase your level of equality. And then as you become a developed country, the level of equality starts to come down. And this is actually what Thomas Piketty, I guess, had spoken here, I understand, has challenged. And he's shown that you know, that actually hasn't been happening uh, in a lot of, you know, more recently uh, industrializing uh, countries. Um, if that's not true, then, you know, you probably would have to accept the fact that development does, you know, require some degree of inequality, but you want to use social policy, uh, tax policy to uh, reduce that inequality, and you need to, frankly, do some degree of redistribution. Uh, because politically, if for no other reason, it's intolerable if uh, inequality uh, stretches beyond a certain point. What that level is, I think, has to be determined pragmatically because it is ultimately a political process. You know, essentially what you're doing is you are taxing or regulating rich people for the benefit of people that aren't so rich. And that's a big struggle, you know, uh, how politically you bring that about. And so therefore, I don't think it makes any sense to say, well, the optimal Gini coefficient is, you know, 0 0.31, because, you know, how are you going to get there? Uh, that's really the interesting question. Uh, on the question of land, it's a very difficult issue, uh, because I think in a country that has been as deeply unequal as this with its history, uh, you know, the actual distribution of property, uh, you know, reflects, you know, this historical legacy, and so it, it constitutes an injustice uh, that and you can see very much why people want to fix that. On the other hand, uh, we've had some pretty disastrous uh, uh, experiences with uh, 
land reform, if you want to call it that, in other parts of Africa, especially you know Zimbabwe, uh, where you basically can destroy your agricultural base if you know if you do it in too populist uh, a fashion. And so I would say that you know it's one of those policies that you got to take seriously. There probably does need to be some serious uh, effort to redistribute land, but it has to be done in a way that essentially preserves people's confidence. Uh, in their property rights and doesn't actually have negative uh, economic consequences. Great. We'll take another round. Yes. There's a woman behind you. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your very enlightening lecture. Um, I just had a question about human rights, because I, I hear that human rights doesn't come into your, your scheme of things here, and certainly in terms of the disadvantages of the Chinese model, you haven't mentioned no. this, and surely it should be mentioned, maybe. Okay, I'll take two more. Please Yeah. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you very much. My name is Tamara Nider. I'm from the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, South Africa. And um, I just have a question about corruption. I understand it's difficult to implement uh, in many of the great ideas we have, but um, illicit financial flows is a very real issue within the world and, of course, affects the prospects of a developmental state. So I just found that it was a bit simplistic blaming just, for instance, the African countries for that issue. And uh, with tax havens and the likes of London and and, and everywhere else, I mean, just to yeah. unpack that a bit more, what that means for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, one more. Jeez. Thank you. Just a quick question. If you went to a country that needed a developmental state, but paradoxically the conditions didn't exist for th that state, where, where, does your, where do you go from there? You need to build a developmental state, but the conditions don't exist. Yeah. Okay, so on the question of human rights, I, you know, in, in my, if I had diff given a slightly different lecture, uh, I would have said that, you know, in any modern political order, uh, the rule of law is really one of the critical pillars. Uh, the rule of law limits the ability of powerful people to do what they want, but it also protects human rights. I mean, the, those rights are embedded in law. And part of the function of law is to protect minorities, to protect individuals, uh, and to give them a sphere of liberty so that the state can't encroach on that. Uh, and you're absolutely right that China is ter I mean, I, I'm not advocating the China model. Uh, I was actually just talking about should you take a Chinese offer uh, to build a dam or a road or an electrical system here in Africa. China itself is not a model for anything as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, they have put apparently more than a million Uyghurs into basically detention camps, you know, concentration camps, as their attempt to deal with religious diversity. Uh, they are implementing a social credit system whereby you're going to use AI and machine learning to monitor, you know, the most minute transactions uh, and then use that to punish people that, you know, oppose the regime. And so you're actually attempting to put into place a form of totalitarian government that we've never seen before because technologically it was never uh, possible to do things like that. And things have been going in the wrong direction in China ever since Xi Jinping uh, took office. And so I do not like this as a, you know, as a model precisely because I don't think the Chinese really care about human rights. Um, so on the corruption question, I didn't mean to be, again, you know, I could have gone on at, at considerable length about what you do to actually reduce corruption. And obviously, one of those things is on the developed countryside, because you are absolutely right that Western banks uh, facilitate the laundering of corrupt money coming out of uh, countries in the developing world. There's no question that that's the case. Uh, and they can do a lot more uh, to eliminate you know, those kinds of loopholes and tax havens uh, and so forth. There's been some progress in that uh, direction. Uh, I think actually a lot of the um, efforts have actually been undertaken by NGOs that want greater transparency in that sec sector, and therefore they've been pushing you know, for better legislation that will crack down on, uh, on that sort of thing. Uh, so I think, you know, both sides of those, that issue have to be, uh, have to be uh, joined. A lot of the funds 
that have um, been spirited out of developing countries need to be repatriated. But you know, a little bit of that is happening. So for example, the US Justice Department uh, actually has been very good on this one MDB scandal in Malaysia, uh, you know, where Najib apparently stole close to a billion dollars uh, you know, from their national, from their sovereign uh, wealth fund with the complicity of Goldman Sachs. And so, you know, they've indicted people. So, you know, hopefully there's going to be more of that kind of uh, vigilance and activity. Uh, so what does a developmental state do? Well, I would say the following. Uh, if you remember that x-axis, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I was supposed to put up this slide. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Sorry. Thank yeah. You. Um, I would say that um, the state, if you want to promote development, you should concentrate on stuff that's towards the right side of that axis, uh, which has to do with basic public goods, because many developing countries are not good at providing public goods that everybody would agree the state is really responsible for, like electricity, like clean water, like roads, you know? Uh, all of these things, I think, in this country, uh, you know, you've, you've had a hard time uh, achieving. Uh, and so if you want to be a developmental state, you know, get the electricity on 24-7, right? Uh, uh, it's very hard, it's actually very hard to develop if you don't have reliable uh, electricity. And you end up like Nigeria where every business has to have a generator, you know, because you can't uh, rely on the public, uh, you know, the public services. So. Uh, so in that sense, I don't think the Chinese are wrong. You know, they, you know, they do do other kinds of developmental things like promoting high technology. I'm not sure that that's the most productive, you know, use of, of state funds. But certainly, the part they did get right is that they're really good at, at building stuff uh, that is of general public uh, benefit. And so that's what I would. That's the advice I would give to a would-be uh, developmental state. Hey. Um. Yes, right, right at the back. Hi, uh, I thank, uh, thank you uh, very much, Professor, for your talk. Um, my, mine is a very quick one. Um, what does the ecological crisis pose um, in terms of thinking about the role of the, of the state? Especially the which, I'm sorry, sorry the which crisis? You're going to have to talk up. Oh, okay, sorry. Wow. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking about uh, if you could reflect on the ecological crisis and what kind of questions it raises about the, about the role of the state, especially considering the failure of um, market initiatives to deal with the ecological crisis. Oh, okay. Talking about the carbon trading and how that has failed and all that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, so, okay. Yes, all right. Sir. Sorry. Uh, good evening and thanks for the talk. Um, my one has to deal with, uh, I think it was a concept you covered in one of your books titled Trust and the role that trust plays within societies. And I mean, if you look at what's happening in Europe and even what happened in America, when citizens start to believe that the system, whether it is the elites or even the government elites themselves, no longer have the trust. And if you had to just relate that to South Africa, where the conceptualization of trusting the states and elites, whether they are white or black, can you actually build a society without that fundamental thing of trust? And I remember in your book, you touched on one of the reasons Asian states tend to do very well is they tend to under-legislate many things because there is a level of trust. Now, you can have the South African constitution which over-legislates many beliefs, but it really just boils down to the fact that we do not trust one another. So can the state really develop without trust? There was a woman at the back somewhere, no? Um, yes, right at the back. Hi, Prof. Um, thank you so much for your lecture. Um, my name is Ngosi. I'm actually a VITS alumni. So I uh, studied international relations. And having studied that, your book, The End of History and The Last Man, was one of the prominent books. So I'm going to ask my two questions, sorry. So the first question is, uh, <laughs> mm, in terms of your, your, your book and your hypothesis, right, knowing what you know now, that uh, there's been a rise of populism, as you mentioned, the resurgence economically of China, and also countries in the Middle East, right, would you still 
be uh, vehement in your hypothesis about uh, the end of history? That's my first question. The second question is uh, on the developmental state, right? So I think, as you see in time, that when a state develops, it also uh, attracts foreigners because those people would be looking to better their lives, right, in that developing state. So having mentioned what you mentioned about uh, populism and the fact that majority of the times foreigners are blamed for that, how does the state then balance trying to develop and also trying to curb the rise of populism? Thanks. Okay, okay. so on the question of environment, um, you know, environmental protection is one of those classic externalities that the state is really responsible for. Uh, and I think that if you step back a little bit, uh, states have actually done a lot, you know, to improve the quality of air, to provide clean water, to make sure there are green spaces, you know, the, the impact of the environmental consciousness that arose beginning in the 1960s has been pretty great. And most governments, you know, are pretty, um, good at, at controlling, um, you know, the older forms of pollution. When you get to something like global warming, you've got a very different problem, which I think is rooted in the, the structural incentives of, of the problem itself. So global warming is something whose negative effects uh, oftentimes are going to be the worst for somebody that doesn't live in your country and they may not be as bad for you as they will be for your children, uh, or certainly your grandchildren. And at the same time, you're being asked to pay a cost to mitigate global warming uh, that you have to pay right up front, right? So if you have a very far-sighted government uh, that understands those long-term risks, you know, you will make those upfront payments, but clinically that's a very hard thing uh, to get um, uh, a lot of publics to do. Uh, and furthermore, there's a lot of countries, so, you know, with India, let's, let's take India right now. Uh, India wants to modernize. It wants to be the next China. Uh, it has a big uh, shortfall in electricity, and it turns out that it's also got huge coal supplies. They've not been exploiting them uh, because uh, basically Coal India is a SOE that's run very inefficiently. If they can privatize it and, and operate it more efficiently, they will actually be able to generate the amount of coal they need to, you know, basically push themselves to the next level of development. But that country by itself, if they do this successfully, in the next decade will put as much uh, carbon into the air as Europe, you know, has tried to take out uh, in, uh, in the past couple of decades. Uh, and so that's the international cooperation side of it as well, that uh, you have to say, well, we're going to make these short-term sacrifices, and in the meantime, we can't get you know, other countries to make similar sacrifices, and we're still going to be cooking uh, at the end of this process. So that's kind of the political problem that's, you know, that's, that's involved, and that's why I think solving the global warming problem or the carbon problem is a much harder problem than, let's say, solving the problem of dirty air in Beijing, because, you know, dirty air in Beijing, all the residents of Beijing get really upset about it, and the government says, oh, we got to do something about it, and they move the plants, you know, out of the province, and then the air cleans up, and everything's fine. Carbon isn't that easy, you know, carbon isn't that easy, because you're not going to see the payoff uh, that quickly, and it is going to cost you up front. So, I think that would be my general explanation for why international cooperation on this particular topic has been, uh, you know, difficult to achieve. Uh, on the question of trust, uh, that's, um, you know, that's a very good one. I did write this book back in 1996 called Trust, in which I argued that if you live in a high trust, what I call a high trust society, it actually economizes on transaction costs and it acts like a lubricant uh, for the economy because uh, you don't have to write long contracts. You know, um, Silicon Valley actually was classically an example of this, that in Silicon Valley, contracts are shorter than they are in other parts of the United States. 
because there's actually a higher level of trust between the venture capitalists, the entrepreneurs, uh, the, you know, the, the engineers that, that work there. Uh, and the question is then, where does trust come from? Uh, and that's a complicated uh, story. I think it can come out of traditional sources like you know, common shared culture, shared religion, uh, this sort of thing. In a modern society, I think it comes from things like education, uh, because one of the things that, you know, especially a professional education does, it, it teaches you not just skills and knowledge, but it also teaches you a certain set of professional values. Uh, and so that's why you can trust your lawyer or your architect or uh, doctor, you know, if they've had the, you know, the right kind of training that incorporates those kinds of public-oriented values. Uh, what we've seen is a across-the-board decline in trusted institutions in very many countries, beginning with the United States. Uh, I, actually, I think that trust between citizens in the United States is still pretty high. What we don't have is trusted institutions, and that's really led us to, uh, I think, a kind of very dangerous point because uh, we don't trust the government to pay, you know, to do things effectively. Therefore, we don't want to pay taxes. We don't want to give the government authority, and then the government doesn't deliver good services. And then we say, see, you know, there's no reason to trust the government uh, in the first place. Uh, and furthermore, you know, we've seen this massive growth in political distrust, uh, where the country has gotten extremely polarized. And, you know, I mean, there are Republicans that have said, you know, I like Vladimir, I can trust Vladimir Putin more than I can trust a Democrat. And I think you're in pretty sad shape, you know, when, when you get to get to that point. Um, I, I'm not sure that I have any particular advice for a country like South Africa that has this history of racial polarization that, you know, it's simply going to have to deal with. I think that, you know, my the general argument I was putting forward in my identity book, in my new book, is that you do need to. You know, you have to recognize the fact that people have these separate identities and experiences. It's just not realistic to pretend that they don't exist. But I think that they need to be counteracted by a more integrating narrative that builds a kind of democratic national identity that allows people to believe that they're at least working in a common political space bound together by belief in their democratic institutions. Uh, and that that, you know, can act to some degree as a, a counterweight to the, the distrust and the polarization that is created by, uh, by those, um, those identities. All right, so you snuck in two questions. So let me answer, uh, answer both. So the, the first thing I would say about the end of history hypothesis is you need to read these two 500-page books uh, the origins of political order and political order and political decay, because that's basically my effort to rewrite the end of history in The Last Man, based on knowing a lot more about the world than I did when I wrote that first book. Uh, and, um, you know, I think the major modifications that I made there were to talk about, you know, I, I didn't fully appreciate the importance and the difficulty of getting uh, to a modern state. Uh, when I wrote The End of History. And so that two-volume work is really about where the modern state comes from and you know, how did it arise and, and what are the difficulties. I also didn't appreciate the possibility of political decay, meaning you cannot just go forward by building political institutions and modernizing, but you can actually go backwards. And I think actually the United States has gone backwards uh, in, in the last couple of decades in terms of you know, I mean, you, you talk about state capture. Here we have a milder form of it uh, in the United States where you've got very powerful, well-organized lobbyists and interest groups that really shape the government's responses to developments in their own self-interest that are not representative of, you know, the American people as a whole. Uh, and this is a constant problem with any country that wants to build a modern state is that, in a way, it's not a natural uh, it's not a natural institution in the sense that people's natural instincts lead them to favor friends and family, right? Uh, and if they're told, no, you have to hire somebody who is uh, qualified, 
you don't know this person, but they have the skills and the ability, uh, rather than your cousin uh, or your friend, you know, their inclination is going to say, no, I want my friend, you know, I want my, my brother-in-law to be, uh, to have that position. And so there's this constant pressure to what I call repatrimonialize uh, a modern state, and, and that, I think, is a process that you can see uh, repeated in history over and over. Uh, the, the, the question about immigrants is really something that I deal with a lot in my current book, on, in my identity book. Um, and it's a, it's a complicated issue because I think that actually, in addition to the inequality created by globalization, the deindustrialization, the job loss, it's actually also the movement of people that has really contributed heavily to this uh, right-wing backlash that we now see all over the, uh, certainly all over the rich world, but I guess, you know, you've got a form of it here in South Africa and, you know, it exists in, in a lot of other, uh, a lot of other countries. And my position on this issue is the following. Uh, I actually think that immigration is good for the world. Uh, I think it's good for an economy because you get access to, uh, you know, skills and people, diverse, you know, ways of looking at the world that can foster innovation and, you know, help grow the economy. Uh, plus which you have, a, I think, a moral duty to take care of refugees, people that are fleeing human rights abuses, you know, terrible conditions, war, uh, and so forth. On the other hand, uh, I think that it is uh, also a very political matter. Uh, I think as a normative principle, a democracy does have a right to control who is a member of its community, and therefore it, it has not just a right, but an obligation to control its borders. Uh, a democracy is sovereignty of the people, and if you cannot define who the people are, in a way you don't have a democracy, right? So the people have the right to say, you know, we want this level of immigration and not another level of immigration. And we have to be able to control you know, control our borders sufficiently so that we can hit the level of immigration uh, that we really want. Uh, if you don't do that, first of all, as I said, normatively, I don't think that's the right conclusion, but as a practical matter, uh, you're going to feed this kind of narrative uh, that, you know, global elites are trying to undermine our national identity by allowing uh, foreigners to come in. And, you know, I think that was the mistake that Angela Merkel made in 2015. Million Syrians show up in Central Europe, uh, and you know she very generously offered to take them in. But it was a kind of unlimited offer that then scared a lot of people into thinking, you know, how are we going to deal with this number of of um, you know en uh, immigrants uh, in a country that doesn't really have a great record of integrating you know culturally different people uh, into their society. Uh, and I think it, it's, it's a perfectly reasonable prudential decision to say, okay, we want to help as many people as we can, but we have to be a little bit careful about that and, and really figure out uh, how many we can actually, as a practical matter, uh, incorporate. Great. Um, yes, right at the back, the woman at the back. I'm trying to spread it. Um, um, thank you, Prof, for your uh, lecture. Um, you had in, in your presentation the role of the private sector, but you didn't cover much of that. So I have a question around that. Um, South Africa's um, government, as well as its financial sector, signed the Paris Accord. And um, that, that, of course, uh, means that in the next couple of years, we need to transition. But as everybody knows, we have an electricity crisis, and we're probably going to be um, having a bit of a competition between people who want us to stay on coal because it's cheaper versus what we've signed up to. So at some point, there's probably going to uh, be some kind of tension between the financial sector as well as um, government because nobody was going to be funding that. So my, my question to you is, in an, an environment where the, the state is incapable, can the private sector be capable? Or is it incapacitated by the 
public sector environment that it functions in. So can the private sector in South Africa, for example, play a role in helping to um, move the country forward in a space where the, the, priv the public sector isn't as capable? Okay. Thanks. Yes. Um, yes, sir. Uh, hello, um, Sensei Fukuyama. San, um, Kombawa, Ogenki I, I don't speak Japanese, but if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, um, <laughs> I wanted to touch on uh, two, uh, two, uh, two <coughs> topics. The first one is, um, I remember you showed your X and Y axis. Uh, the first one is uh, homogeneity. Um, specifically, if you looked at the top right corner, We'd seen that um, specific countries like France, Denmark, um, England, um, they tend to be quite homogeneous. And is that perhaps the reason why um, their economies are doing quite well? And um, if you looked at Singapore, Singapore was quite the exception. Um, Singapore, we know that they do have Chinese, Malays, and Indians, which is a variety of people there. But um, why is Singapore doing well? I suppose that um, your, your book on identity may speak to that in the sense that there's a collective goal. Um, second as well, you didn't touch on human capital in Singapore. For example, the leaders in Singapore uh, tend to be handpicked and are actually the best in the country to lead the country. And also, you, you didn't talk about the salaries as well because the politicians in Singapore are, are paid the highest. Um, are those sort of the reasons why they, the country is doing quite well? Thank you. I'll take one more now. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to get the professor's opinion on a couple of uh, African uh, political economic issues. One is, uh, what is your opinion on the current continental free trade agreement? Uh, is it good uh, or bad for Africans or for which Africans? And uh, um, how do you interpret the fact that uh, the countries in Africa which are doing best economically, de uh, developmentally, are the one with fairly authoritarian regimes? And that speaks to the governance uh, development uh, issue that you talked about. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so on the question of the use of coal, uh, that's a dilemma, I, and I wouldn't presume to <laughs> uh, express an opinion about which way you need to come down, because you need electricity, and you've got the, I mean, it's very similar to what I described with India, right, where you desperately need the reliable electricity in order to grow economically, but it is going to come at this uh, environmental cost. Uh, and I think that, you know, hopefully that will be a decision that can actually be taken as a result of a democratic deliberation about the relative, uh, you know, merits of, of these two positions, not as a result of backroom deals and, you know, uh, politicians that are getting paid, paid off and, uh, and this sort of thing. Uh, I would just say that there are very few countries which are simply virtuous on this issue, you know, this climate issue. Uh, you just think about the, the yellow vests, you know, the Gilets jaunes in France. What were they protesting and saying that the elites were not listening to them? It was a gasoline tax that was meant to reduce French use of gasoline uh, for meeting their Paris uh, Accord uh, goals, right? And this led to this huge popular uprising because people didn't want to pay more for gasoline. Uh, so it's a political, you know, it's a very political, uh, difficult political uh, issue to, um, uh, to resolve. Um, so I guess uh, that's about all I can say on that. Uh, so the question of, so let me just say something about Singapore. So Singapore is very well, it's a very well governed um, largely authoritarian, it's kind of soft authoritarian regime. Uh, I do not like using Singapore as a model, which many people are inclined to do because Singapore's conditions are just unique and they're not shared by very many other countries. Uh, for one thing, it's just basically one city, you know, uh, and you can govern a city a lot more effectively than you can govern a large, diverse, 
you know, country. Uh, and it also has a particular historical um, legacy. And I think the most important thing is it just got lucky. You know, its first great leader, Lee Kuan Yew, was himself not corrupt. He really had a clear vision of uh, where he wanted the country to go. It was developmental. Uh, he was good. He stayed a long time, and he was very successful at it. Uh, and so a lot of people say, well, we want the Singapore model. And what I would say to them is, well, if you can tell me where you're going to get this succession of Lee Kuan Yews to run your authoritarian country, I'd say go for it. Uh, but most countries do not know where to get good authoritarian leaders. And therefore, I think they should stay away from that, that model. Now, the question of, uh, of homogeneity is, um, it, it's a good one. I think that in general, um, ethnic diversity oftentimes can lead to obstacles to growth simply because the political system needs to somehow reconcile you know, these different ethnicities, and, and that's not so easy in many uh, cases. On the other hand, you do have countries that have economic, uh, that have ethnic diversity, and they've done pretty well. So Singapore, you've already mentioned. You know, Switzerland has got three national groups living in it. Probably the biggest success story is India, right? I mean, India has, what, 16 national languages? I mean, it's divided by caste, by religion, by you know, ge uh, geographical diversity, uh, and yet it's managed to hold together as a, um, uh, as a democracy, and it's been one of the fastest growing countries in the world over the past uh, uh, decade, uh, actually longer than a, a decade now. Uh, so it depends on other things, uh, and it really does depend on creating a national identity that is based um, not on ethnicity, but on a you know, an idea that will incorporate different ethnicities uh, into a single democratic community. Uh, and that's actually one of the things that worries me right now about Prime Minister Modi. Uh, you know, the founders of India created basically a pretty liberal society that incorporated all of this diversity within uh, the structure of these democratic institutions. And I think what Modi and his BJP Hindu Nationalist Party have been trying to do is to shift that national identity to one that's based on one religion. Uh, and the fact of the matter is there are, there's not just one religion in India, and I think down the line this is really not a good, um, this is not a good path for that country to follow. On the question of these authoritarian regimes, right, so Rwanda and Ethiopia have done uh, pretty well uh, as authoritarian countries. Uh, I would say um, first of all, it's come at a big price in terms of human rights. Uh, uh, both of those countries have persecuted, so if human rights are important, you know, that's been a cost they've paid. In Rwanda's case, uh, I think they've got the following problem, that it's a very personalistic regime that revolves around Paul Kagame. So Paul Kagame had a lot of impressive qualities as a, you know, as a leader, but it is kind of a Tutsi dictatorship, you know, that's suppressed uh, a, a large number of, you know, people that weren't Tutsis in, in that country. Uh, and he has not created an institutional structure that will survive his departure. And so I think what's going to happen is, you know, either Paul Kagame will be president, you know, 25 years from now, uh, because there isn't really a succession uh, plan, or if he somehow leaves the scene voluntarily or involuntarily, all of those ethnic tensions are going to come roaring back because they haven't really been resolved. They've just been suppressed, you know, through authoritarian power. So I'm not sure that that model is going to be sustainable uh, into the future. Uh, Ethiopia is actually a very interesting case. It was a developmental state. Melis Zanawi, I actually read his uh, MA thesis, you know, which was about being uh, Africa needing a developmental state, and they've done uh, reasonably well. But again, it was a kind of Tigrayan, you know, authoritarian. It was based on just one um, minority ethnic group, and there's a lot of ethnic tensions that are under the surface there. Uh, I admire the current prime minister, Mr. Abe, who really seems to be trying to open up the country in a way that, you know, is I think raising the hopes and expectations of 
uh, a lot of the people that live there, but whether that country can actually negotiate, you know, its own ethnic issues is going to be a real, you know, is going to be a real challenge. So these authoritarian leaders can do it by simply suppressing ethnicity, but that's not a solution to the problem. You know, I think a real solution to the problem is actually creating a kind of liberal national identity that actually allows each ethnic group to have its own realm of identity and freedom, uh, and not simply by using authoritarian power to, uh, you know, to suppress uh, people that aren't members of that group. Great. Well, I'm going to have one more round of three questions. Um, this gentleman right at the back there. Is this on? Yeah. Thank you for looking in my direction. Um, my name is Gerhard. I've got a mi background in mining and I've got a background in computers and I dabble in astrophysics. Um, I understand what took the, what broke the back, if you like, of the 2005 or 2008, whatever it was, collapse in the States, was a thing called quantitative easing, which injected liquidity into the market, which was supposed to be lent out. But Japan's now doing it, so is China, and so is the EU. What is your opinion of that, please? Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. In the middle, yeah. Hi there, Professor. Um, you averred earlier to the growing polarization, and uh, particularly between uh, the left, uh, which is um, propagating uh, perhaps an ideology um, mutating from Marxism. And uh, on the right, we have something that is now called um, economic nationalism, but it's a, a national socialism, perhaps by another name. Um, do you see these two ideologies clashing the way they clashed in the Second World War, uh, perhaps directly or indirectly as they did in the Cold War? Or do you see perhaps a third kind of model, um, if not a Cold War, then perhaps some hot peace? Okay, my last one. I'm going to look for a woman at this point. Um, yes. Thank you very much. Erin um, McCandless here at the School of Governance. Uh, within international intervention in the area of state building and peace building, it broadly reflects some of the critiques you've been talking about and, and, um, t and the evolution in terms of uh, approach. And there's been a big critique of liberal peace building over the last 15 or so years, and now there's a great investigation of what should, you know, what kind of peace building and state building should there be, and should international donors and uh, actors support? And so I'd like your opinions on that. I mean, one of the big issues is hybridity, actually supporting and engaging endogenous efforts, while also trying to bring the best of international human rights and other other aspects. So we get to hear your thoughts. Okay. Well, on quantitative easing, yeah, I mean, um, the reason that all these central banks got into that was that they felt constrained. You know, so normally, when you have a big um, financial crisis and then a big recession, you want to use fiscal policy to stimulate the economy. The United States did that to some extent, but because of its overall indebtedness uh, and because of Europe's overall indebtedness, and Japan is the worst of all in terms of uh, sovereign debt, um, uh, they were not able to expand their budgets and, and stimulate the economy. So all of the stimulus efforts fell on these central banks, and they did it by uh, essentially buying up, you know, uh, low-grade securities, taking them off the market, uh, and uh, supporting the economy through monetary policy. Uh, the fear, you know, that a lot of people expressed right from the beginning was that that would lead to runaway inflation down the road, and. You know, the strange thing is there's no inflation to be seen anywhere in any of these countries. So something, you know, is funny is happening in the global economy, which has to do with um, 
uh, you know, I think kind of missing demand uh, and a kind of excess of capital in the world that makes the monetary policy work differently from the way that it did classically. Uh, and so I'm not actually that worried about uh, the fact that you know, the ECB and Japan are still doing monetary easing because I don't think that the negative consequences are, are really going to show up. Uh, on the, um, oh, so the question, yeah, whether we're going to have clashing ideologies, um, I think that the division in the world is, it's not exactly an ideological division in the way that we understood it in the Cold War. Uh, what you have is basically countries that want to remain committed to a liberal international order, that are liberal democracies themselves, and they believe in an open world in which you know, there should be greater uh, economic integration. You know, that's Emmanuel Macron, kind of this become the de facto leader. Uh, and opposed to them are not countries necessarily with different ideologies, but a different kind of social consciousness. So they care a lot about sovereignty. They don't like, um, you know, uh, delegating sovereignty to international organizations. They're socially uh, conservative. Uh, and, you know, in a way, the one that's been organizing this is Putin, is, is Vladimir Putin in Russia, where, you know, he's saying that basically these liberal countries are all degenerate, you know, uh, they want to impose gay marriage on us. Uh, they want to undermine our traditional religious values, and we don't like it. Uh, now, in that group, uh, none of those countries actually agrees with each other because they all have their own national traditions, they have their own churches, and, you know, and so forth. Uh, but they do share a general kind of social uh, conservatism and then hostility to the liberal institutions like the European Union, like NATO, uh, that have been the basis of the older international order. So is that an ideological clash? Not exactly. I, I'm not quite sure what to call it, but I do think it's kind of the basis for uh, that division of the world. Now, on the question of international intervention, um, I would, if you haven't read it already, you know, I, I participated in this two-volume Daedalus uh, study on civil wars that was really triggered by the Syrian civil war and the international responses to it. And I think that the bottom line of the conclusion is that, um, you know, you had the, part of the problem with the, the old model of intervention was uh, kind of excessive expectations for what would come out of the intervention and then the subsequent settlement. Uh, which proved to be beyond the capacity of the international community. So, you know, essentially you would intervene in a conflict situation. You want to stop not just the immediate uh, fighting, but you also want to do reconstruction, reconciliation, and ultimately get economic development going. And on top of that, you wanted these countries to observe human rights and then become functional democracies. And it turns out that that's really hard. Uh, and that actually the international community runs out of patience uh, and resources, you know, usually about three or four years into one of these interventions. And then they decide, well, actually, we don't want to stick it out. And they begin withdrawing. And then uh, things, you know, go back to the way they were. Uh, so it requires, I think, an adjustment in expectations as to what you actually want to achieve. It probably does have to be tailored to the specific you know, conflict uh, in question. Um, and sometimes, you know, you're going to have to settle for good enough governance as opposed to good governance, uh, because the good governance is really not achievable, at least by, you know, the international actors. Oh. Yeah, I think is that it? That's, uh, yeah, that's it. Everybody, we're going to. you big ideas and a sort of tour de force. So I don't think anyone's been disappointed. We're going to end. We've asked the Vice Chancellor of this, Adam Habib, to say a few words um, in closing for tonight's <coughs> event. That was great. Thank you. Uh, 
So friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to be long. It's been a deep uh, uh, set of conversations. And I, I do want to say a couple of things quickly. Uh, the first and the foremost, if there's anything we remember from this lecture, from Francis's words, it's perhaps the word that politics is primary. And I think it's an important point. The primacy of politics is often not understood in South Africa. And I, it, it's, you know, Anne said state building is a political act. I, I think Francis went further. He said development is a political act, not any economic act. It's a political act. And I just wanted to highlight three or four issues that come out of that principle statement, which are really dilemmas if we see this about inclusive development. The first is in the era of inclusion, the period between the 1950s and the 1970s. It seems to me what we had was a bipolar world, which created the incentive structures for international political elites to make concessions to development. So you can't understand uh, South Korea's development or some of the, yeah, yeah, the kind of East Asian tigers without understanding the concessions that international, that primarily the United States made to enable the development. And the second, it seems to be at the domestic level, was this was an era of industrial capitalism, which allowed for the emergence of unions and the formal organization of workers that created the incentive structure for national political elites to make concessions. The problem about inclusion in the current era is we're in a completely different world. Globally, we're not in the bipolar world, although China is emerging, but we don't have the domestic variable of industrial capitalism. Instead, we have financial and maybe even digital capitalism, where you don't have the large organization of workers that creates the incentives and struck incentives for inclusion itself. And so the question is, what are the preconditions, political preconditions for inclusion in this new era, which is very, very different from that traditional era? That's the first dilemma we have. The second, it seems to me, is this important point that Francis makes, is the rise of neoliberalism enabled the inequality which enabled the social and political polarization of our societies. Now here's a quibble, Francis. You say that the right-wing populism has emerged, but you say that left have not been as successful. Well, it depends what you mean by the left. If you're looking at social democrats in Germany, in a lot of ways, these were socially liberal organizations that were part of the establishment. But if you look at new forms of the left, think about Greenpeace as much in, in Germany, and it is as strong in some senses as the AFD. Think about Corbyn in the Labour Party. Think about Bernie Sanders and Ocasio-Cortez in the US. And then we have both the mobilization of the right and the mobilization of a new, if you like, far left. And what are the implications of that? The third is if we're going to address social polarization, we have to address inequality. If we're going to address inequality, we've got to confront the issue that every single time we've been able to address inequality, elites have been able to sacrifice the short-term the, the short interests for long-term interests. If you want to understand social democracy in Western Europe, it was elites giving up their short-term concessions so that they, that they can enable long-term capitalist sustainability. Well, if we're going to do that, are elites at that point in the world today? Are they prepared to consider constraints or restraints on CEO remuneration? Are they willing to consider restraints on dividend flows? Are they willing to consider more aggressive tax policy? And it seems to me that that's the third dilemma. Will elites be willing to make short-term interests and concessions for long-term sustainability? And then it seems to me the fourth and final lesson is what you said is government effectiveness is a precondition for both growth and inclusion. You can't get growth and you can't get inclusion without getting government effectiveness. Now, if you're going to do that, how do we prompt our political elites in the direction of government effectiveness? Clearly, the one issue 
in the South African context has to be a viable opposition. Because you, if you guarantee office, there's no incentive for you to take meritocracy seriously, the state seriously, and state effective seriously. If you're worried you're going to get kicked out of office, then you start thinking about that. But if you're thinking about the opposition, is it a liberal opposition? Or is it a right-wing opposition? Because if it's a right-wing opposition, you're prompted in the other direction. And so it seems to me that that's something we have to think about. The final thing we have to think about in relation to that is you said in the Chinese case, therefore model of development is infrastructure. Perhaps in this new context, our model of in, uh, development should be education and a focus on the middle classes. Because if you create an educated middle class, the incentive structure emerges within the society to hold both political and economic elites accountable. And it seems to me that I pose that as a question of a new model for development that is focused particularly on enabling an educated middle class emerging in the domestic context. So to end, if there's a lesson for tonight in this broader event, it suggests what is important is deep deliberation, as we've heard. It suggests that context matters because policies don't apply equally in every context. It suggests you must have hope, otherwise what's the point of doing all of the hard work to getting accountability? And most importantly, or as importantly, it suggests the capacity and integrity of public servants is paramount to making and transforming a society. So with that, I want to thank Francis Fukuyama for enabling a very deep deliberation this evening and from the CDE and others for enabling this and partnering us on all of this. And I want to thank all of you for a stimulating conversation. May we have many more. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Bert. Good comments.